what is the best street heads out there? Well, there's a lot of opinion on why this is better than that brand, AFR versus TFS versus Prodex versus Edelbrock. There's a lot, but we'll talk about street and some kind of street and race, nothing all out. So we'll leave behind all the the Glidden Victors and you know the SC ones and all that. But we'll basically stay within the confines of street heads and some kind of mild racing. Uh, Taking into account basically 11 to one, you know, 13. I mean, no, 12 and a half to one maximum on the street. Granted, you got a light car. Uh, nine to one, which, which is the best heads that we can utilize for your given combination. And this is what's going to be. I had to reinsert this part on this video because I feel it is very, very important. Because a lot of people, and I've seen it through the years, they have the wrong sale on their head that they bought. You know, something sold to them that was probably on the shelf for a long time. First and foremost, you must buy, even for a street, okay, the smallest combustion chamber you can get for your street engine. The reason is, most engines out there come with a flat top. And a lot of them as well come with a little bit of a dish. If you have one of them pistons with a slight dish, that's added CC. Most engines out there come from the factory with a flat top piston. The representative CC of the head is roughly 64. Now, with a 64 CC head and a flat top piston, okay, we're not taking into account uh, head gasket thickness that could all skew our, our engines. The head gasket is too thick, you lose your quench, added clearance you lose more compression now with a flat top and uh, let me see oh if anybody has one of these moroso calculators get one all right it helps a lot with the calculations Iskenderian has the same one that's round and you can turn in the dial and look at some of these see combustion chamber and compression ratio uh, here we got gear ratio cubic inch uh, calculation Let's get back to this. With a flat top piston, 64 cc, you end up with a 9 to 1 block or 9 to 1 compression engine. Well, for a lot of the uninit uninitiated, they think that's okay. That's too low, like you heard me say. At least 10, 5, 11 and a half desired. This set, 64 cc gives you 9 to 1. 58cc gives you 9.8, which is about 30 horsepower, given the fact that most of us, it's an accepted fact that, you know, um, compression point is about 30 to 40 horsepower, roughly. Let's say 30 horsepower, okay? So, you're looking at 58cc is 9.8 to 1, 52cc is 10.85, almost 11 to 1. That's a big jump. So, when you bought a cylinder head that is, you know, uh, and you have a flat top piston, you bought a 72cc cylinder head, that's 8.2. No wonder I see a lot of people that build engines or with aluminum heads, in fact, make it worse. Especially a lot of Chevrolets, they sell 72cc cylinder heads. Ouch. 72cc and then aluminum, you hardly have any heat, you hardly have any thermal efficiency in your engine or your engine block. Even though you have a, the, the, one of the best cylinder heads out there, if you don't have compression, you have none. Okay, so look at here. 72 cc on a flat top is 8.2 to 1. 68 cc, which I see a lot of sold out there, especially Chevrolets, that's 68 cc, eight and a half to 1. 52 cc, 10.8. 58cc 9.8, 64cc 9 to 1. These numbers I gave you is with a flat top piston. And I know there's a lot of people out there, especially with 347s, Stroker 331s, or 383 with a dish piston. 
So what do you think these numbers will be if you had a dish piston? From 72cc at 8, 2 to 1 to 52cc, 10, 8, 5, almost 11 to 1. Okay? 8, 9, 10. That's 11. Oh my God. So you're looking at 72cc at 8 to 1. Okay? And then 52cc at 10, 8, 5. Let's just say 11 to 1. 8, 9, 10, 11. That's three compression point. Just choosing the correct or the wrong head. If we take the number of 30 horsepower per compression point, three, six, nine, you lost almost 90 horsepower on your street engine by buying a big CC head. And I know a lot of Chevy guys do this because there's a lot of 72 CC heads out there being sold. A lot of 64 CC or 62 as well. With the Fords, the majority are 64. There are some at 58. There's, and I've seen some at 52 cc. I think that's TFS. That is absolutely great. So if I buy a 52 cc head and I end up with a 1085, and you bought a 72 cc head, <laughs> why? I don't care what fancy camshaft you do, what kind of intake, carburetor, fuel injection manifold, whatever. You're not going to make up 369, 90 horsepower that you've given away because your buddy or you <laughs> thought the bigger cylinder combustion chamber is better. It's a virtual avoid at all costs because of the worst case scenario with a flat top, straight flat top with a 10 head gasket, you'll hit 11 to 1 with a 58cc head. And this is what's going to be pretty good because I will try to explain in detail why I feel this is. Okay? And uh, sometimes many other channels out there have done dyno test. Uh, just check flow testing. Am I going to go through that? You can see a lot of that results out here in in YouTube or any, anything really in social media. And I'm just gonna to try to give my opinion uh, and uh, why that is. So we start with factory heads. If you have some E7 castings, which is the 87 on up, avoid the 86s. There is high swirl combustion chamber, they don't breathe. They got good torque, they'll burn rubber real good, and then they fade out, they cut off at higher RPM, 4,500, 5,000, and start to choke up. So avoid the 86 heads, go perhaps 82 to 85, avoid the 86, 87 on up, or the E7 heads. With big valves, 190, 194s, and a 160, really, if the head porter is really good and knows what he's looking at, go for it and avoid uh, any of those magicians out there that just ports the, the flange here and doesn't get through the inside. Uh, that doesn't make you uh, any more power than the stock one. It's just pure, uh, just like a picture frame. <laughs> doesn't do, doesn't do, you, do you any good whatsoever. The proper porting should be from the flange all the way through the throat get the right diameter between the valve and the throat diameter of 89% and you're going to be good to go. Same thing with exhaust. Three angle valve job on both. Okay? Or if you can do a five angle so you have, you know, a, a back cut on the intake valve uh, that would really help your your power. And I, I've, I've run across a bunch of you know, really good ported, even with stock valves, if it's ported correctly with three, a three-angle valve job, it'll help. But putting the bigger valves will even be better. But I'm not saying all along that uh, the stock heads are junk. Well, for the application, mild combination, you can be good with that. Excuse me, as long as you put the big valves in the right 
spring, get rid of those uh, um, retainers and locks and those two pieces, uh, they're junk. They're, they have a tendency to fly off. If you can buy some lightweight titanium stuff for a valve train, why not? It helps, especially if you're going to wing it. Okay, but you don't expect too much out of a stock 5 volt. The next choice is if you want to go a little above the E7 heads, do not run the 289 hypo heads. Not only are they rare, they're better off. Well, if you're going to do some porting like this cylinder heads here, it's a hypo Ford 289. And you could look at, there's some distinct uh, uh, casting differences in it, and here they are. That showing the valve spring pocket, all that, but the port and the valve size is basically the same. It's no bigger than than what comes from the factory, but it's got all the right. Well, you know, I mean, you get the spring pocket, it kind of holds it in place at high RPM, so it's probably worth something. But uh, if you want to modify this cast things, make sure you have someone know what they're doing and not ruin it. Okay, and you can get some decent power out of it. Combustion chamber is smaller. So it might be a tad better than the E7 castings, and uh, be careful. They're worth a lot of money, and it's, if you got some kind of restoration job with some ported heads in it, why not? Here behind me are the uh, GT40 heads. We're stepping up away from what's from the factory, and I prefer the GT40s, or if you can find those old J302s, and uh, there are some are a lot of inconsistencies with the castings with the J302, especially the early ones. And some are already in that J302. They're built by uh, the original factory that cast them, uh, Allen Root. And uh, some of those are real good. But we can take a close look at these two cylinder heads. Now, on the GT40, you got to look at the three bar layout on the front of the head. I stay away from the GT40P, first thing, he's got a smaller exhaust valve, and you can put the big valve, but I just don't like the way the combustion chamber is laid out, and I think uh, the three bar GT4 is the way to go. I've tested them at the racetrack, the GT4 and three bars are superior to a GT40P. Not only that, the header is an oddball, okay, and when you step up to a GT40P and decide to try another cylinder head, guess what, you're out of luck. The headers don't match up. It's only exclusive to that casting. I don't want that. I want something that can interchange headers and intake manifolds and all that. Uh, the P, it changes your downpipe, everything. I mean, what a mess. Avoid. But here you go. Let's look at the GT3 uh, bar and the J302 and what kind of modifications we can expect out of them. This is the 3 bar. Uh, there's a three bar that designates a GT40 non P. Okay, and there's the exhaust pattern on them. And this is the J302. It has a D style, kind of a D port uh, exhaust. Okay, so those are the distinct indications. This has been revised. The standard bolt pattern has been plugged. And they're using the uh, with the two and seven o'clock pattern. Okay, and so remember these guys. When you see the three bar as a GT40 Lightning head as well, not the Explorer or P head. Here's here's a look at the intake port on a 351 Windsor that I used on my race car from years ago. And here's a GT40. All right, you see these things here? It's amazing how they are very, very similar. All right, just excuse the dirt here. It's been sitting around a lot. Now, what I have done with the 351 Windsor, which could be done with a GT40, was I press in a guide here and we drilled it and run offset push rod and this push rod restriction 
is cut and you have a better line of sight straight through the valve. Okay, so um, when you do that, and I don't have that head anymore, somebody owns it, but it's out there floating around someplace, somebody's street race car, I remove this entirely by pushing in an aluminum um, bushing in there. You'll see it quite a bit over here. It's, it's not as obvious. Otherwise, they flowed the same with a little bit of an edge on a GT40. Okay, and when you put the big valves on bottom of them, that ratio does not change. When we look at this other head, it has the modification done to it. There's a bushing still right here, which moved the port farther back. Same thing here. Okay, and what that does is it strains out the port to move the port and keep it straight right here. Unlike this one here, the bump is on the right side. This side here, they put the bushing on this side to strain out the port. What I would have done, like here, was I would have put the bushing right here on this side and just shift this whole intake port that way. I could go on and on try to show the difference with the cylinder heads, but if you want to follow up on this thing on a more detailed manner, uh, check out E7 to Yates rundown on this video. That would give you a more detailed explanation of the differences with these heads. And anyway, with all this kind of work, moving the pores, putting some kind of a bushing in there to move the, the pusher bump out of the way, and uh, improve uh, you know intake flow really uh, the peak flow doesn't really gain that much more but the low and mid lift flow picks up quite a bit because a lot of the uh, maximum flow is basically determined by the intake valve diameter and the throat diameter that said if you would really put your money in a GT40 or E7 heads or a much modified 351 Windsor has like I ran it during the muscle car days back in the 70s, 80s. It is not sufficient to tell you the truth. I think the maximum you could have this GT40s or uh, much modified 351 C9 D castings, uh, no more than 347. It's already marginal with a 351 Windsor stock with this kind of heads. So uh, in short I would say if you want to move up beyond a 347 you know uh, and stroke it up bigger uh, 393, 408, 421 whatever that might be you're better off stepping up to the Brodix, the bigger AFRs and all that. But in fact you know I've seen some guys get beat uh, with AFRs with a much modified 351 Windsor or a much modified uh, GT40 heads. Not the P, but the GT40 three bars. That said, the explanation can be attributed to the fact that the thermal efficiency of a cast iron head at 9 to 1, okay, at 9 to 1 pistons, uh, there's not much uh, heat there being produced to make power. And uh, the cast iron GT40s, E7 heads, sometimes will produce much more stronger low and mid-range torque or horsepower. And uh, when you have a 347 with 10 and a half to one and above, uh, I would say, okay, or maybe even a mild 302, well, I should say mild, a built 302 with 11 and a half to one minimum, yes, I would say, then go with those Brodick Street Heads, the AFR, the Edelbrocks, all that uh, TFS, and uh, it would be superior to the GT40s. 
So I would say, when you have low compression or mid compression 347 stroke or a 331 and the GT40 at that level can, you know, can produce good, good power. But when you have 11 to 1 or 11 and a half to 1, 347, 331, 302, then I would say step it up a little bit to the smaller offerings for AFR and TFS. Therefore, we must uh, make it clear that uh, the GT40s would max out with a 347, 9 to 1, or 10 and a half to 1, or a 306 with, uh, you know, stop compression and stuff. Uh, when you get 347 with 11 and a half to 1, or if you strive a little higher on the street on Octane Booster, I will not waste my time with a GT40, uh, three bar, and even let's not forget the aluminum GT40 X or Y. Uh, it's a slight improvement over the cast iron, but uh, the heat retention of the aluminum casting, you know, your tipping performance isn't as good or as responsive as a uh, aluminum or a cast iron GT40 or even a stock head with big valves ported correctly now by a very, very good uh, head porter uh, will have a real good tip-in and responsive performance. Ultimately, the big valves win in this scenario. Okay, GT40X, Y, or 3-bar will beat stock castings with the stock uh, small valves from the factory. Therefore, even with aluminum, GT40X, I would max them out at stock stroke 351. Anytime you stroke it to a 408 or 393 or one of those, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more like a 36 stroke, uh, it's compromised already. So I want you guys to save your money. In fact, even that tiny uh, 165 castings or 170 put out there by other manufacturers like AFR or Brodix or whomever, okay, except we have an exception with a twisted wedge and I'll explain why. A 170 will outperform the others uh, bigger offerings from the other factory because there's one thing is not explained there clearly as far as a TFS twisted wedge only is concerned. Therefore, I will, this next proceeding segments, I will explain that. You're looking at a Glidden Victor head. And here the valve is closed, but you can see how much shrouding is prevalent right about this area compared to the twisted wedge. Okay, so uh, that's a Glidden Victor that's been partially open as well, unshrouded should we say. But you can see the effectiveness of the valve when it opens up. It gets very, very close to the cylinder wall. Now we're looking at the Ford TFS high port and the valve from the flange is roughly about 4 to 80 almost a little under under uh, 4 300 okay 4 to 85 or something like that but you can see how much this has been relieved of course this has been CNC'd been unshrouded big time at 500 lift compared to the twisted wedge you can see the shrouding that's prevalent right here okay the twisted wedge is farther away from here okay but the difference too is the uh, the distance of the flange to the center of the valve okay like I said four three four two eighty or something like that a little a tad under the four inch 300 from flange to center line of the valve plays a big difference in how it breeds this is an Avenger head and there's some funky looking grooves on the chamber which in the next videos I will be explaining how to soften the combustion chamber and apply these grooves um, another option instead of doing the softening of the combustion chamber this is what I've done for many many years and then when you look this is shrouded and this valve even it's not even big 
I think this is a 205, maybe a 208. I haven't really measured it. But the uh, valve center line from the flange is just like all the other ones. They're all the same. But when that valve opens up, it is also just as shrouded. TFS, Twisted Wedge is different. AFR, Brodix, Edelbrock, they all look similar. Except for just minor variations. And this has been CNC uh, machine already. You can see the CNC marks. Okay, and uh, if this was stock, it would, I don't have any stock head here as a sample, but it is shrouded. Okay, you're looking at a twisted wedge. Notice how far this is from the corner of the combustion chamber because the valve traveled this way, towards the inside and down, towards the flange. And when you open it, open it about 500 lift this is what you're looking at there's a lot more opening there especially around here okay and this has already been modified the chamber but you can see where the valve is unshrouded big time especially around here all right and that's flow right there it's not a canted valve it's closer to Yates and yields significant advantage. And the distance between the flange and the dot here is roughly about four, a little under four inches. Okay, so uh, when I measure that, I the flange to the center of the valve. Now we'll look at the standard DFS, Brodix, and all the other ones. Non-twist wedge. I will show the distinct difference between a twisted wedge. Of course, when you look at all these different heads, 195 cc, 185 or 200, 205, and you compare that to a twisted wedge, thinking you're going to have the same effect. Actually, the twisted wedge might cc smaller, but the fact that the valve went closer to the flange this way, this is the flange of the intake, the actual runner volume got smaller and shorter perhaps maybe wider and a little bit taller. Now, when you compare a 200 or 220 twisted wedge to a 220 whatever Edelbrock, uh, you know, uh, AFR, since the intake valve got closer to the flange, meaning the runners actually got shorter, will gain you some top end. At the same time, to make up the volume to be the same, a 200 standard AFR, Brodix, Edelbrock, to a 200 twisted wedge, more likely the twisted wedge perhaps might be a little wider and shorter. That said, now you wonder why they have a distinct advantage. I've seen many tests um, of other types of cylinder heads on a small block for there's so many there I'm not going to follow everybody and do the same thing because the, the net result is basically the same. There is a distinct advantage with a twisted wedge. Be it the straight twist wedge, the 11R twist wedge, or the, the basically the R, R head twisted wedge which is very very impressive. We'll touch on that again uh, coming uh, next moments here. Now let's talk about the 408. Everybody just about automatically go <clears throat> four inch stroke on a 40 over bore, 408. Guess what? The AFR 220 works great. And the other offerings are similar offerings from Brodix and everything else also works. Now, if you got ideally not uh, an 11 to one or 10 five, but like a nine to one engine, I prefer to run a, an air gap RPM with a 750 carburetor, dual plane with a spacer, an inch spacer at least, on the bottom, double pumper, <clears throat> and it's a fairly light car or medium weight car, uh, you know, those 220 AFR works great. And of course, 
uh, the offerings from Brodix and everything else just works just fine. What you're going to find out, you're going to have a pretty doggone uh, responsive engine combination. Right? For a stroke, that's big block territory as far as stroke is concerned. And then again, if you got like 11 to 1 or slightly more or somewhere between 10.5, 11 and a half to 1, I'd prefer that, you know, you, the 220cc uh, <clears throat> Sell their heads, still work fine. The best guide really is to look at their catalogs, whatever Brodix or, or Edelbrock, whatever cubic inch that they specify there that their their heads work, I would follow that advice. This is that me, you know, I, I go a little bit beyond that by being more specific. If you have a single plane with an, at least a 10, 5 to 11 and a half to 1, run a 220 with a Victor Jr. manifold, not a super Victor, a Victor Jr. with a 750, and of course, a, a bigger camshaft than any of the Alphabet or the E cam. Be, uh, you gotta be custom, all right, or slightly larger. And you just refer to the catalog from CompCam, whatever they have for a 408, and everybody else, you know, and preferably there, if you want a tad bit more, then I'd say again. Uh, the twisted wedge would be a little bit better. No, I shouldn't say better. Well, I've done a lot of track runs, and every time I see, um, you know, a twisted wedge engine, be it four eight, it always shows that uh, a slide, you, know, you could see that it's a lot stronger. Well, I should say you could really see the difference between. I mean, I like the AFR because they have a metric valve stem. Uh, make him light. I love him for road racing and all that, uh, especially with 347 or a 353, 363. Excellent combination. I would prefer that because they're more in line. They're not like the Cleveland or a little bit uh, with the, the twisted wedges, you know, a, a longer push rod point, about almost a little, a tad below half an inch longer push rods for that to function properly where the geometry is going to be correct. Now, Let's move up to, uh, besides the 4 right, and like you've, you've always heard me before, on the street now, we're, stay, we're still staying with the street combination. 4100 stroke, 4170 stroke, or 4250, okay? This engine combinations are a lot bigger, even though it does, there's basically the same overbore except for the uh, the 450 stroke, I usually go 60 or 80 over with a production block. I use cement and, you know, sonic check your trophy on your block. They're fairly thick and you could usually go past 60. All right. So you have a 437, okay, and uh, 433, I think, if it's 40 over. But regardless, okay, you got a 450 stroke. That's bigger than most small block or big blocks. <laughs> a small block. Now, uh, that said, what is superior? What I found out, especially for hot street cars or, you know, somebody that wants to be a little bit be beyond or a little bit more than the regular build, something more serious, 4250, 4170, 4100, Twisted Wedge R. The regular Twisted Wedge 11R or the regular Twisted Wedge, uh, you know, 170 or the 190, uh, they're a little bit on the small side. Especially on a light car, a Fox body or early style, first generation Mustang, yes, the Twisted Wedge R will be. It's kind of hard to to over port or overhead this, this engine with this one stroke. They're fairly light. But the combination, you're looking at a factory block under 500 pounds, more like 475 pounds, displacing 400 plus cubic inches. All right, uh, with a 4100, there's going to be quite a bit there. Uh, what I found out, even with a twisted wedge R, not the big 240cc ones, okay, the 220, we're still staying with the 220, uh, they're still very responsive. Uh, you could easily build. Uh, a mild combination to run 1050, 1070, NA, right? With with a fairly uh, good cap, healthy uh, street cap. 
if you go solid, uh, solid cab with, and you up the lift uh, past 600 with these things, you know, uh, I'd say, I should say, okay, okay. If you have just the regular twisted wedge, uh, the first generation uh, TW, uh, they will work. They will work with the 408 or even with the, the 4170 and the 4100 stroke. Uh, but they're tad a little bit on the small side, even a 190cc. Um, how should I say this? I've seen them. If they're around 600 lift, you're, possibly, you're, you're, you're okay there. You're on the edge between switching to an R. But let me just put a little warning out there. The 11R is a very impressive cylinder head. And many years ago when I first tested the first one that came into production, what caught my attention was when I went past 600 lift, the other cylinder heads, whatever make, when they reach the peak lift, they kind of like maintain. You just see them uh, maintain the flow. Uh, oddly enough, with the 11R, as soon as it peaked, I, I don't remember, 620 or a little bit more, it nose dive. It caught my attention. Instead of maintaining whatever CFM they are rated at, it actually reversed itself. All right, so. Uh, the 11R is an 11 degree and a 13 degree exhaust angle. I think it's great if you're staying within those valve lift perimeters. But if you want to run a 640, 660, I'd run, run, run the, the regular twisted wedge. And then if you go beyond that, 720 on the street, 740 on the street, which I've done, I would recommend a, a hydraulic roller. At that point, I would recommend a... a solid roller so you don't have the issue with the lifters being uh, you know compromised because of the hydraulic plunger and all that uh, i would suggest you run a solid cam uh, at that 700 plus the r is a definite choice there's no ifs or but they're very impressive and they will produce gobs of power 750 pop gas that's reachable okay if you're going for big cubic inches on the street on a small block or big cubic inch small block. This head here is the high port CNC and this is the twisted wedge R. This is the standard twisted wedge uh, 11R and, and first generation twisted wedge. All three is very impressive. Like I said, if you have a 600 lift hydraulic roller cam, this is what you got to use. When you want to go with a a uh, hot street car, the R head is better. Okay, uh, it allows you more airflow when you up the lift big time to 700, 720, 740 on the street. And this, the high port, is also very impressive. By the way, this is 240 cc runner, this is 240, this is like a 190. Okay, and uh, they can feed a uh, big small block. But one thing that is really not very good with twisted wedge is that it requires a, a specific piston. You can buy some of those with a standard inline Ford valve relief and also another valve relief on the intake for the twisted wedge. It doesn't seem to be a, a hassle, but the extra valve relief is added CC, so it drops your compression. So if you think you're hitting 11 and a half to one, you might not be hitting 11 and a half to one. You'll be hitting a little bit less than that because of the added valve relief. Now, if you look at the one in the center, I won't do this. This particular one here, it's got a huge exhaust. This is basically ruined, okay? And uh, this came up to my attention. Uh, the guy ran it, it didn't perform very well. And he said he's got a, uh, a 408 and his other buddies with a 408 similar combination he was getting beat left and right there's no exhaust velocity here if you look at that that's almost big block huge I can put three fingers barely put two here two and a half here but this <laughs> look at it 
it is overdone. Guys, do not get over, well, should I say, do not get uh, overzealous into making a big exhaust bar, make it look like a big block. That is not what you're looking for with this cylinder head. No matter what you do, it's still a four inch bore. The bore space of a small block, you can't really have too much exhaust port. Okay, and like I said before, I've talked about it with everybody else. We have too much exhaust valve. We can definitely have too much exhaust port as well. Okay, this is pretty good. Very strong combination. Same thing here. When you look at that, that's a CNC race port 240. And this is somebody's race port. And I checked the CC before. It's also 240. But the exhaust is humongous. Too big. Okay, guys? Okay, this is the flange for the high port. Twisted wedge R. Excuse the spider webs. And a standard first generation twisted wedge or 11R. Very similar. What you can see here is I actually plate this 11 R's, I mean the, the R head, I add spacers for them and just as well as the twisted wrench. In fact, these are the spacers that I add on. Okay, I have that made. I can actually port that all the way up there. And I do that with a blue tether. There is a problem with doing that with the uh, high port because the rail is kind of like limiting me there but look how far I can go that is about close to half an inch going up all right and same thing with the R with the 11 R or the regular twisted wedge what I usually do I machine the bottom of that so I can put the plate flush right there and voila you're going to have a doggone, basically, SC1 flange on an otherwise uh, regular cylinder head for the street. Very impressive. By the time you get it up here, you can flow tremendous numbers. I'm not at liberty to say, but it will be very impressive for a street head. You don't have the big volume, but you'll have a darn good velocity because the port doesn't have to bend. To get to the valve because it's a higher port angle for this tube and it becomes a high port R head high port 11R or first generation twisted wedge. Here is a uh, AFR. I machined off part of the valve cover and the first plate on the bottom took part of the uh, shaved off valve cover rail and this one is raised about four hundredths of an inch and picked up flow and uh, it's either welded here or epoxied on the top runner because it gets super thin so I had to short it up big time improvement this for the LAPD police car Here's another picture of it. There's the plate, and I know there's an external line because this is a stock block layout here. So I had to add an additional oil line on the front of the lifters, which is starving with this combination of high lift camshaft on a stock block. They don't have the crossover. The only crossover oil port is on the back. Not enough. Here you can see by the time it's done up and I'll post a video of this engine running. The two plates are sectioned off there and you can like I said again you can see the Velcro rail. There's a 9424 intake manifold I think or 2920 well, whatever I'll forget I got brain fade it's too late and this is now my exit for the water port. The TFS twisted wedge R I had the exit here. On this one I had the, uh, the exit on the front of the manifold. And then I have a bleed hole on the back that fed to the front. 
is an AFR 220. You guys are looking at the engine for the LAPD or the new LAPD race car. It's a small block for now, this, this the startup engine just to get the chassis going. Anyway, just to show everybody, it's a 351. And if you can see the spacers on the intake port, that's why it's kicked up quite high. And I place a spacer back there, a solid. Uh, plate to anchor the whole block if you look at here there all right that uh, and it's got uh, front towards a front type header system and uh, it's got a single dominator on a 28 28 intake manifold it's the water line oil pump, external oil filter, and on the back here you can see the spacer on the intake manifold. This is the first one on an AFR that has done that. You can see the the anchored, uh, keep the block from splitting. Flex plate, and it's got a, oh, can you take off the, the, the scoop? And it's got a dominator in it. So, black motif. So, uh, we're looking pretty good. External line going to the lifter valley because it's a stock block. So, I have an external line going to the lifter valley because it usually starts there with, with a big camshaft. So, here it is. And this is a DFSR head, as you can see. The two plates sandwich and raise this port about half an inch or a little more than half an inch and picked up power big time and I had to do a remote exit for the water from the standard housing that was there before it's eliminated you can see the hoses right here and I had to clear part of the distributor because now this intake manifold is sitting way high. A little over half an inch taller than before. To wrap this up, all I'm going to say is I look at the Yates as the ultimate cylinder head for a small block Ford here on the left. The twisted wedge is closest to that. Everybody else from the high port to the Edelbrock to the Brodex to the AFR is configured like this. And then we'll talk about the groove later on in, in the upcoming video. Therefore, the TFS having the port volume very much in line with what's needed for the street or street engines or not really all out racing engines. But this one here matches up perfectly for the RPMs we run on the street and the port volumes that we need for the street without even without even having to use a Yates type big port high port. Therefore, that's my justification to say why I like the twisted wedge over just about anything.